Hi, today I'm going to talk about this book that I finished because I really liked it. Can you see it alright? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really good book. Um, I am going to spoil stuff, but before I spoil stuff, I want to say, if you haven't read the book, obviously, and you're still watching because you don't want spoilers, um, if you like sci-fi at all, if, even if you just watched a Star Trek episode and liked it and think you might like to, to absorb more, read the book. It's really good. Really, really good. I can't recommend it enough. Okay. Now I'm going to start spoiling stuff. Okay. I think they're gone. That always gets me when YouTubers do that. It's like, okay, are you gone? It's like, well, yeah, I get it's like endearing to talk directly to, but on the same level, I, I am very aware this is a camera. It's quite strange. Um, but either way, we're going to talk about this book now. Right, I've got some notes, because I've always got notes. Okay, the first thing I really like about this book is that the characters are not internally stereotyped, if that makes sense. It's one of the things I really hate about Star Trek, because Star Trek, I think, is is one of the worst offenders, um, where they say, oh, all Klingons are like this, all Romulans are like this, and it makes you think, well, all of them? <laughs> because uh, there are... Like, there's so much difference between, like, me and Phil, who lives down the street, or whatever it might be. So, all the people from this planet are exactly the same as each other? But then, they're kind of... They've been slowly trying to work their way out of that, um, and say, oh, it's a dominating personality trait, but... But, like, it still kind of gets me. You still see it in Star Trek, and you see it a lot in other forms of media, too, and it really annoys me. That's something I like about this book, which is that... The characters, for example, two of the main characters, um, they've got ridiculous sci-fi names. Aleph is one of them, and what's the other one? Um, Pelon Hawk, which is a ridiculous name. The thing is, it's not even Hawk like the bird, it's Hawk, H-O-R-C. Say that, that's a bit of a weird one, but you know, we're gonna go with it. Okay, the idea of the book, now that I've got my bizarre character note out of the way, the idea of the book is that it's set in this incredible sci-fi world um, with sort of human drama happening within it. Like how Game of Thrones is a fantasy series, but it's human drama happening in a fantasy world. And I think that's what makes made Game of Thrones so, so popular, for goodness sake. Um, but the idea of The Rig by Roger Levi is that it happens in a world where the afterlife is kind of real. Kind of, just about, in a way. Um, when you die, there's a chance that your brain will be compatible with these, like, suspended animation pods. And if it is, um, you... Well, I, that's a lie. It's if, when you're close to death, that they, they will sort of scan your brain and say, okay, your option... You, you can go into one of these suspended animation pods and go into the sea <laughs> on, this, on this planet. And um, when a cure becomes available for your condition that you're sort of dying from in a hundred years, two hundred years, whatever, we will bring you out of the pod, cure you, and then you can go back to your life, or start again, have a new life. And that on its own is a, is a brilliant concept, but then it also comes out that all of the people in these pods, when a cure becomes available for, I don't know, call it another Star Trek trick, is to put some nonsense word and then the word flu or fever, so Smargleforp fever. Um, if, say, a cure becomes available for Smargleforp fever, um, the, the people on um, the internet, essentially, get to vote on the people in these pods that have the fever, um, okay, which one of these gets to come out of the pod and get cured and go and have their life, sort of thing. But there's like another level of complicatedness, which is that the stories that they tell about these people like, they have to sort of obscure their identities, because the idea is that it can be a whole brand new start when you come out of the pot. Um... So, the story is told from two perspectives. One is, is um, a reporter who sort of interviews people and gets information about their life and makes these stories online. And some of the people she interviews and some of the people she talks about, those stories are then used for the pods. Um, when they take them out of the pods um, and they sort of use her stories on the websites to say, this is what Tim was like. He was a carpenter and he did these things and all this sort of things. And it's like, um, the idea is that it's like the X Factor, but instead of winning a Christmas number one, 
you win a second chance at life. That's the idea, basically. Um, and the other half of the story is told from the perspective of this... Well, he starts off the story as a child, and then he sort of ages throughout the story. Um, at the start, well, I mean, at, all the way through the book, he's called Aleph. Um, and he's like the sort of genius son of this genius guy. Um, and he was born on one of the only planets which still observes any kind of religion. Um, the idea of the book is that humans left Earth and found this other solar system, went to live there, and during the course of the move, um, it was like so, such cruel things happened back on Earth. I think they never actually go into it, but they sort of the implication is it was like climate change slash solar flares slash things like such cruel things happening everywhere that a lot of people's faith kind of just got eroded because they were like, look at all these horrible things. How can a God allow this sort of thing? And the only people that were left being religious all sort of gathered on this one planet called, I'm, I always used to call it Gehenna, but it's not Gehenna, it's Gehenna or Jehenna. It's never really said out loud because it's a book. But um, yeah, Jehenna. And then, so essentially this planet is full of people that are massively religious and that's where Aleph is from. And he sort of grows up and learns that his father, um, who he believed to be this very stoic religious man, actually had um, sort of a side hustle, almost, <laughs> where he was running sort of the accountancy for this um, sort of space gangster type guy. <laughs> and then um, as part of this ongoing feud between these, these two space gangsters, um, Aleph's father is killed and Aleph's father sort of steps, sorry, Aleph's father is killed and Aleph steps in to take his place, basically. Um, and he sort of, he, he learns more about the business and the accounting and law and stuff as he goes forwards and he sort of slowly sort of installs himself as an irreplaceable cog in this machine of people doing essentially atrocious things. They're, they're, a, they're a mafia, a space mafia, a spafia, <laughs> um, a space mafia um, and he sort of, it's about his moral feelings looking out at that. He was so traumatised by his parents' death that he's sort of like, is sort of numb from then on. And then as time goes on, things happen to him and he gets a bit older and he's like, um, he forms a friendship with the son, uh, with Pelham Hawk, the son of um, one of the Mafia bosses and he like slowly works his way through the rank until he's this indispensable cog. And um, he meets a lady and he settles down and she gets pregnant. And the, it's, it's, well, it's a part of the story, but it's not really worth mentioning. The lady is like part of the mafia. She's also one of the accountants, like alongside Aleph. Um, and the lady gets pregnant and they settle down and he's really happy. And then Pelham Hawk says, oh no, I'm dead ill. I'm really ill. I'm gonna die any minute. Um, I've got cancer. Uh, it's coming for me sort of thing. And then he says to Aleph, I don't want to die, and he sort of reveals that he still believes in God. Despite the fact that he was forced to leave Gehenna, the religious planet, he still believes in God. And um, he's like, I don't want to die from this cancer, Aleph. I, I, I need to continue living, I need to continue my father's business. I want to sort of keep going. You find a cure for this, please, <laughs> sort of thing. And um, eventually Aleph comes up with this idea of like, putting uh, Pelham Hawk in suspended animation while a cure is found, or the very best, um, putting him into suspended animation until he can be put into forever suspended animation, until a cure might be found. Can you see where I'm going with this? And eventually the two stories sort of merge and it, and you sort of find out that the entire system of this afterlife that people get to have is um, this system that Aleph sort of dreamt up by which Pelenhawk can be kept alive for hundreds and hundreds of years while a cure is found for this cancer he's got. And that is, leads me beautifully onto my second point, which is the huge smack in the mouth twists that this book has. The first sort of two thirds of the book are, are really, really good and you're sort of, you're on the trail of this conspiracy with the with the reporter lady, and you're on the trail of these bizarre things that the Mafia bosses are doing with, with Aleph. And then the final third, it just sets up the final hammer blow for like a million different setups that were done in the first sort of, first portion of the book. And you end, literally I was sat there in bed and I, like reading the book and I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. 
because things kept happening, it kept just smacking me in the mouth with such a, a, a ferocious twists. And there are the things like afterlife isn't actually real type things. Like, oh my god, yeah, okay, the afterlife isn't real because it was all designed for Pelenhawk to keep him alive. And then Pelenhawk decides to motivate Aleph to cure the cancer by putting Aleph's wife into suspended animation with him. And then that's another smack in the face, and you're like, oh my god, that's the only thing tethering Aleph to the actual real world, and now he hasn't even got that. And um, it just builds and builds and builds all the way through, and then the payoff is fucking bleak, but really satisfying in the same way. Um, like, it sort of comes out that all along, all these hundreds of years now, that, um, that, that Aleph's wife has been pregnant for. Uh, by the way, she's got a really cool name, Pirebe. I think that's a really cool name, um, that Pereve has been pregnant for, um, it actually wasn't Aleph's child. And he's like been so, he's was taken in by the lie so completely, and he was like, that, that's not my child, you're not pregnant with my child. Um, and Pelenhawk discovers that his disease can't be cured, and so to sort of destroy Aleph's spirit essentially, he ends up killing Pereve, and then he kills loads of other people, and it's like the reporter is also there, essentially working as Aleph's agent, against... oh, it's like... right. It's a very complicated book. I don't know if I'm making any kind of sense, but I fucking love this book. So we're gonna go with... the huge smack in the mouth twists are fantastic. I... I... if you read... I cannot believe my camera died, and I also cannot believe that I only have one battery pack, so it would take me six hours to make this video if I did not finish it on my phone. So here we go. Luckily, I've only got one point to finish on, which is that the characters are utterly superb. It's an incredibly complicated story, and in complicated stories, characters often feel reduced to their functions, essentially. It's like, oh, in this scene, such and such is just there to press a button. Such and such is just there to shoot somebody, or whatever it might be. But in this story, it feels much more like the characters are actual people in these situations that are so absurd to you but you would appreciate and admire their decisions in a strange way. And it's really good and I really recommend it. I know I've made not a lot of sense, but this book is utterly superb. It's world... hang on, there we... there we go. <laughs> uh, it's World Book Day. I'm recording this Wednesday the 3rd of March. It's World Book Day tomorrow, Thursday the 4th of March. If you re if you buy this book tomorrow... I mean, I, I can't... I can't offer you like a discount code or anything, but I would encourage you to... What is going on? The universe does not want this book, this this book to be sold and this video to get made. Buy the book, it's really good. Um, if you can't buy the book, I'm sure it's probably cheaper on Kindle or something. It's like an underappreciated gem. It's really, really good. If you like sci-fi at all, you'll absolutely love it. It's really complicated. Drew me in and did not put me down until I finished the book. Absolutely stunning. I would definitely recommend it. Um, thank you for watching this video that the universe did not want to get made. Um, I hope you appreciated it. I hope you appreciate... Uh, it looks like it's gonna fall again. Okay, let's take a pause. Okay, it's much less likely to fall now, but... Let's see these things. Oh, there we go. This is much, much more poorly framed, but much less likely to fall. Can I... if I... can I... That's a bit better. Yeah, okay, we're gonna go with that for the final 10 seconds of the video. <laughs> okay. This book is really good. I hope you liked this video. It's World Book Day tomorrow. Read a book. If you like this book, or well, if you think you might like this book, read this book. It's really good. I think you'll like it. And I don't know who you are. If you do like sci-fi, you will like it. I'm sure of it. I love sci-fi and I love this. Um, that is the end of the video. I've got no more points to make. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm going to edit this video. I predict my computer will crash many times because the universe does not want this video to get made. Um, have a lovely day. Read the book, drink some water, be kind, be silly. Thank you.